building recommendation systems in, in PHP 8. I'll, uh, I'll skip the part about who I am because most of you actually have seen me or, or uh, like, uh, like have seen some stuff, stuff about me. And one thing that some of you might know about myself uh, is that I got, a, I got a newborn recently. And aside from having a constant lack of sleep, one thing that's actually, that's actually quite, quite interesting about newborns is that they are natural born pattern matching machines. Like everything that looks like a tit, they will try sucking on it. You know, like, like if they, if, usually it's a tit, but we had a funny situation where uh, my wife was holding him in, in, uh, in front of her head and she was like, wow, he's so intelligent, he can recognize the stuff, blah, blah. And then he j tried, like, like, he attacked her nose and tried sucking on her nose, you know? So, so basically, this just tells you that evolution can be sometimes wrong and uh, not every pattern matching, ma matching machine is, is like, like good. They, they, they need to be developed over time. Now, this presentation is not really about my, my kid. This presentation is about actually uh, doing recommendation systems in PHP 8. But it turns out that there is a lot of similarities between newborns and actually doing machine learning. And if you think about it, actually, uh, all that machine learning is about is about recognizing the patterns, you know? And if you think about it, my, my, my newborn son was born with some basic systems, but he still needs to develop them. So, so if kids are so stupid, I mean, like, like you really have to give yourself some ease, you know, like your initial model will suck, but basically just like my suck, my son tried sucking on a nose, but eventually it gets better over time. The point is don't lose the faith, it gets better over time. Now, another really interesting thing about machine learning in general is that you can actually get really long way without having any freaking idea what you're doing. Like you can try stuff, you can get results, those results might be actually useful and uh, it's cool because you can pretty much get encouraged to continue doing whatever you were doing because, well, you know, like, I think machine learning in general is quite rewarding, you know. And uh, if you actually go deeper into it, you will realize that building machine learning models is, is the least of the problem. Usually the biggest problem is actually collecting the data and sorting the data out and cleaning up the data. But once you have the data, it's actually quite simple and it can be done in PHP. But before we go into like, like how can it be done in PHP, because it can be done, I just like to point out something like uh, I told you that my newborn son really has like a bad mechanism for pattern matching, but it's not really about newborns. I would say that the, the average age here is, I would say between, I, I would take my guess and say like between 25 and then 35, probably like, like median 30. But it takes some time to actually understand this, right? I mean, like, like, like there is a dog and a horse on this image, you know, like, so basically, even though you're developed, you actually need some time to, to, to process what you're seeing. And don't even get me started with, with you know, like, like, like this, what's a fried chicken and what's a puppy? You know, like, like it takes really some focus to actually understand what you're looking at, right? Now, another interesting thing is that when I, when I signed up for, when I, when I wrote the proposal, actually, I was quite curious to, I had no idea why is PHP not used for machine learning, but, but I was actually determined to, to understand that, you know, to see like, okay, what's preventing it from being used in machine learning? And, uh, well, I was wrong. There are some issues, really, but, but the main issue is that uh, it's missing an ecosystem. It's actually missing people to build the libraries. There is no, there is no problem in the language as itself but the problem is actually that the libraries that are available are not really on par with, for example, Python or R or, I don't know, I never used Java for this, but probably Java. So do consider this as, as a potential call to actually maybe consider contributing to some of the libraries that, that I will be talking about. Now, I kind of lied to you. I mean, it's not really missing ecosystem. There are actually two really great libraries. Uh, one is RubikML, another is PHPML. The other one is really cool to check out, you know, like, like to, to, to find more about it, find out more about it. But the one that we will focus on today is actually RubikML, uh, which is pretty much li like full-blown machine li library 
built in PHP, but there is a C extension for actually most of the matrix operations because that's actually what's what's slow. You know, what's usually slow, like doing any kind of linear algebra is is kind of a pain in the ass. And uh, RubyXML is actually actively maintained. Uh, is an awesome library, and as I said, just by just by following a tutorial on on the, on, on the website itself, you can quite get a long way with building something that you can sell to your management as, see, I'm a machine learning engineer now, you know. Now, what I usually like doing is actually explaining the basics. And I want to give you the basics because I think that once you understand the basics and some other concepts, you can actually pretty much understand everything that I'll be talking about and you can pretty much can keep building stuff on your own, you know. So, speaking of basics, I'll actually start with, with very basic stuff that most of you have probably heard of in, uh, I would assume, high school or elementary school, I don't even know, vectors. Because vectors are the, 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 the primary building block that everything in machine learning, you know, like, like builds around. And uh, the whole machine learning concept is about like, like, give me a vector, do some black box function and get some prediction, you know, like, like a classification or regression or whatever, but you need a vector, you know. And you might be surprised, there are some other names about vectors which are like uh, 1D arrays, uh, rows, observations, samples, tensors, believe it or not, or instances. These are all vectors, and I have no freaking idea why they are named differently, but I think it's basically like whoever named them wanted to be unique, you know, so they have different names, but all of this actually refers to absolutely the same thing. It's a vector, you know, so. Um, and let's talk about vectors a bit. If you, if you ask a physics student, or, or if you ask Milan maybe, who's, who's interested in stuff, uh, they might tell you that a vector is like a pointed arrow with, you know, like a length and direction and whatever. But if you ask a math student what's a vector, he would tell you, but well, it's, it's an ordered, num ordered list of numbers. And that description of being ordered list of numbers is exactly what I want to focus on today. Now, Let's take a vector with one dimension, one feature, one column, whatever you want to call it. It's a vector with just one value, one dimension, two. You can graphically represent it as, let me see if this works. Work, yeah. You can graphically represent this on a flat line, just one axis, you know, and with a value of two, right? Quite simple. If you have two dimensions, you have to have two axes, right? Like x axis and y axis. And basically, this is a vector with coordinates two, whoop, two, and two. Quite simple, right? And you can keep doing this. I mean, you can go to three dimensions, right? You can, you can draw a vector in three dimensions. Now, after three dimensions, it kind of, and this is, this is a funny thing, it, it becomes quite, complicated for us humans because we can't really draw in, well, we can, we can use col different colors and stuff, but it's usually pain in the ass to actually draw in four, five, six dimensions, whatever. But what's actually funny and what's really important for, for machine learning in general is that um, basically math doesn't care how ma many dimensions you have. You can have like hundreds or thousands or one millions, one million of features, the same rules that you will see apply whether you have one dimension, two dimensions, or 100 dimensions, or 100,000 million, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'll stick to two dimensions because it's just easier to, to show you based, based on the, the, the two axes, right? So we have vector A, and we have another vector, B, and usually the question that you usually ask in uh, machine learning and then recommendation systems is how do you say how similar these two vectors are, right? I mean, by observing them, you can say, well, they look, you know, like they seem to be pointing in a similar direction and, you know, like they, they are quite similar. The, the, the B1 seems to be lengthier than the A1, right? And that's cool, but, but you can't tell a machine, like how, how if, if, if a computer wants to know how, how, what's the distance between them, it's quite, it's quite complex to answer by, by words, right? So there is one really easy way to, to say how similar the vectors are, and that's by measuring the angle between them, believe it or not. So if you take the cosine of, of, the, of the angle between two vectors, 
the smaller the cosine is, basically the more similar the vectors are, you know. And basically, if the cosine between them is zero, they are actually they are actually the same. And this this is actually called the cosine similarity. Whoop. I went a bit too far. This is called cosine similarity, and this is, it turns out to be really important for everything that I will be talking about. So, so, so comparing two vectors is incredibly important for understanding everything that is about to come, all right? Now, I'll quickly jump to, uh, to something else. If you ever actually opened any tutorial on, on, on like how to do machine learning, how to do this, how to do that, blah, blah, one thing that you must have noticed is either that they are using the, the, the Titanic data set with survival rates, like how many people survived the Titanic crash, or they are using this iris species data set, which is actually just a set of flowers, basically some biologists or whoever like collected like bunch of, measured bunch of samples of iris flowers, flower, and he realized that there are like three, there are three different categories, iris setosa versus but, Versicolor and Virginica, and I hope I pronounced it right, but, but maybe not. The point is, these flowers are actually distinguished by their petal, let me show you, petal, and sepal length and height, and that's it. Based on these measurements, you can actually tell with, with quite high certainty to which family of flowers this, this flower belongs to. And this is how it actually looks like. It's, it's, quite, it's quite, quite, quite an easy, this is the whole data set. It's, it has like apparent one of 50 rows. And what's important to see here is basically that you have these rows, you know, like they are called samples, instances, observations, and you have the columns which, can, which are called features, uh, inputs, attributes, measurements, dimensions, whatever. And on the right-hand side, basically based on the dimensions, somebody said, well, dimensions, the flowers with these dimensions are actually of cetosa type, and uh, flowers with these dimensions are of the versicolor, right? And usually one of the things that you want to do in machine learning is to figure out, like, well, based on the input, input dimensions, I want to know to which category this, this flower belongs to, right? Now, um, for our use case, we will call these vectors, because I just like having a, you know, la, la, like ubiquitous language. And I'll just refer to them as vectors. So we have like 150 vectors here. And this type of data is actually called data set. And interestingly enough, I think this is absolutely the only thing that is similar between languages that data set is called data set in absolutely every language that I used at least. Everything else has a different name, but data set seems to be like seems that, that, that people manage to agree on online, let's call this a data set, you know, because it's a set of data. Now, again, why is this important? It's important because this is one of the basic building blocks in, in RubikSML. If you wanted to actually load this data set in RubikSML, it's actually, well, it's actually, I would say two lines, right? The rest is actually longer. So loading the data set, I think you can see it without, without the magnifier anyway, it's basically about like load data from iterator and basically what RubikSML gives, gives back to me is the data set. And the data set is the main object that you want to work, well, that you have to work when working with, with RubikSML and basically building what we're about to talk about. Now, back to the topic of similarities and cosine similarities. So I told you that everything in machine learning is about li like figuring out based on the input data, like figuring out s some prediction or, or some classification or maybe some clustering, whatever, but it all boils down to give me a vector and give me some output based on that vector, right? And I said that cosine similarity is one of the easiest ways to do that, right? And actually the, the formula is quite, I mean, it could look intimidating if you never saw it, but if you actually apply it on a two-dimensional vector, it's actually quite easy, you know? And basically, uh, the, the, the bigger the number is, the bigger the similarity between two vectors is. So, so two vectors with similarity of one are absolutely identical. Two vectors with, with similarity of minus one are pointing in absolutely opposite directions and stuff like that. And cool thing is that this is absolutely true for no matter how many dimensions you have. So maybe you can't graph it, you can't display it, but you can use it in a formula and get like, for example, in a game, like see how, how far the player is from 
something. You know, you just measure the distance between two points from multiple points, right? Now, there are some other distance metrics. You might have heard about some of them, Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, and stuff like that. And it turns out that Rubik's ML actually has tons of stuff, which I was quite surprised about. It has like tons of different uh, distance kernels for calculating the distance. Why is this important? Because based, some use cases have some better or worse distance metrics that you can use. And it turns out that Euclidean one is actually the default. I don't know why. I'll be using the cosine one, but Euclidean distance seems to be the, the seems to be the default one. Now, back to back to our data set, right? So we said we have vectors, and how do you actually answer like which which vectors are maybe like most similar to to our destination vector? For example, let's say how would we answer the question of which vectors seem to be most similar to to vector with ID one, right? I mean, cosine similarity is a way, but there is a better way of doing, you know, at scale, right? And it turns out that this thing is something that you might have heard about or not really heard about it, but it's called K nearest neighbors. And the name again might be intimidating, but uh, it's actually, it boils down to, you know, like you're as similar as your neighbor is, you know? So, so basically based on like your behavior is probably like the per like the same as, as the people around you are. And turns out this is actually really true, not only in, in presentations and boring stuff like, like I'm talking about, but it actually turns out to be true in, in any social gathering. J just by observing this picture, you can say which people are most similar, you know, like to other people. And the way that you do that, you actually measure who they are closest to, right? Based on who sits with whom, you can say, well, this person seems to belong to this group, or this person seems to belong to that group. And uh, turns out that's 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 really important thing called classification, but we'll get to that. And that's actually true with vectors. The K is basically the number of neighbors you want to see. So you say, like, if, if you start from a vector in a two-dimensional space, and like let's say that I'm a green vector, and I have no idea who my group is, I want to check my three neighbors, like my three nearest neighbors, K is three. And basically I say that, I see that two of them are blue, one is orange, so I must be blue, right? So, so I can identify and I can find my, you know, like inner piece. And turns out that, again, that this is quite simple. I told you that you can get a long way in, in Rubik's ML without having, get, uh, in, in machine learning in general, without having any absolute idea what you're doing, right? And turns out that you can actually do this quite easily in, in PHP by instantiating an estimator, and you can even specify the kernel, because uh, the distance kernel, because by default it's Euclidean distance, but you can say like, I want to use the cosine distance. And after that, you can actually, and this is a funny part, which we'll get about. Basically, you instantiate your classifier, you train your model, and we'll get to what training is, and basically, you can make predictions after that. Now, important part is that usually when you're training your data set, if you, you never have a full data set, just to be clear. You usually have like a specific subset of your set because you can never get all samples out there. So you only have a, a limited number of options usually. And in case of iris species, we have 150 of them. So what you usually do is you split your set, you split your data into like, training data, which you use to actually train my model, and again, we'll see what that is, and the rest you use as a testing, like to test against like, like how good your model is predicting the stuff, how good you're seeing, like who the people belongs to, like sometimes it sucks, as you will see. And usually it's like 80-20 principle, like, uh, you know, like you use 80% of your set for training and 20% for, for testing. And again, it turns out this is extremely simple in Rubik's ML, which is, which is a problem because, again, without having any idea, you can build stuff that works. And sometimes that can be dangerous if you have no idea what you're building ultimately, right? So you can take like 10 test samples and you train your data. Now, what is the training, right? L like, what actually means to train a model, right? Well, if you ask Google, it's basically like, uh, Learning good values for all the weights based on the blah, blah, blah. And uh, I think that sucks, actually. If you ask myself, it's basically about making a guess, seeing how wrong you are, and keep repeating until you're not that wrong anymore. And that's, 
that's really what you should remember about training. Training is like, you start with something, like, like as my son starts with a nose, he sees that it's not really something to be sucked on, and then he proceeds until he gets the proper results or the milk. And in the way of, of iris species, like this is the input array, believe it or not, like these are the dimensions that you put on the input and you want to get predictions on the output, right? And uh, they're called features, as I said. And basically, if I run a prediction on the input data that I specified before, these are some of the, some of the predictions that I get. It's quite easy, it, it works perfectly in PHP. And this whole process of figuring out based on the unknown data to which labeled group it belongs to is called classification, right? And the classification, just one sec, is all about, as I said, you know, like, you have like a label data set, you have features, and you have some, some, something that you want to identify the, 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 the sample as belonging to. Why am I mentioning that? It's because there is a concept uh, called clustering, which is completely opposite. You have a data, you have data, but you have no idea how this data can be split, right? And this co concept is called clustering, and it has a lot of uses, but that's something outside of the scope of this presentation. Now, let me. Why did I spend so much time introducing you to the uh, to the classification? And I, I would assume maybe some of you already knew, like what classification is, how it's used, blah blah. I mean, this is a presentation about recommendation systems and not about basic basic data classification operations in machine learning, right? Well, it turns out that, that recommendation systems and, and classification systems actually share a lot of similarities. They both work with matrices of data where the rows are actually samples and columns are, uh, columns are features, you know, dimensions. But the difference between, uh, between classification and recommendation systems is that in classification, you actually have a fully specified data, like you have all columns specified, but in ratings, you have a matrix that is not really fully specified. It's sparse, it's missing data. And if you think about it, li like if you take Netflix, for example, and if you take a random user that rated 10 out of 10,000 movies, his matrix, like rows would be users and columns would be, would be movies, and that user would only have 10 out of, I don't know, 10,000 10, columns filled, you know? And we call that a sp sparse matri matrix. And basically, you can't run data classification on a sparse matrix. That's a problem. And just, just to give you a clue, th this is how it could look like. You know, like you, you could have a user one that rated only two movies, user two that rated only four movies, and stuff like that. And as I said, this concept is called sparse, ma sp sparse matrix, right? Because data is sparse, the data is missing. Now, it, it turns out there are a lot of similarities, and I'll tell you what it is now. So, so back, to this example of, back to this example of our sparse matrix of, of values, right? So let's say that we want to answer like, what are some users that are similar to my user, to user number one, for example, you know? Well, you could do that by observing like, well, it seems that user number six seems to have a similar preferences based, to, based on my user and based on the preferences, because if I'm similar to, to some other user, that means that usually, most likely I could have similar preferences. Sim I might like the, the similar movies as, as the, 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 the destination user does, the similar user does, and I can actually use that similarity to fill out my matrix, and basically I could inherit that I would probably dislike Peaky Blinders, but I would likely like Money Heist and Squid Game. And that's your, that's your very basic recommendation system out of nowhere out there. You know, like find a similar user, see what they, find similar users, see what their preferences are, and based on that, inherit some values. If you go back to this concept of, uh, of people belonging to groups, we want to really classify our rows, but in a sparse matrix, right? And I'll just go one, one step back to, to, to remind you that we used cosine similarity to actually measure vectors, because if we go back here, these are all vectors again. So we have vectors, but we just don't have all values filled. So the question is, how do you run similarity between vectors without fully specified values, right? And uh, turns 
out that you can actually do that quite easily, and I'll show you. So, so for this example, I'll actually use the, there is a movie lens data set which contains uh, one, uh, 610 rows, 610 users, and 9,700 users, uh, 9,700 9, movies. So basically, it's a matrix with 600 rows and 9,000 columns, right? And let's say that we want to find movies for user number five, user with index five. It could be any user. It could be us, I mean, for all we know. It could be a data from Net Netflix, and we could be the user number five for all we know, right? So if you check the data, it seems that this user has rated 315 movies out of 9,000, which is actually quite impressive because usually us users usually actually like maybe five to 10 movies. I mean, how many movies did you really like, right? I mean, you only like the stuff that you really like and you usually just keep this, the rest, right? So, what we actually want to do and what's really the most simple recommendation system is find the users most similar to myself, basically see what they like and based on that inherit the, what I could like, right? And we could do that really simply by creating cosine matrix or basically taking each user, comparing how similar we are to each one of them and basically recording that into a matrix, sorting that matrix by a distance. So, so pay attention, we are discussing the distance here. So, so, so smaller is better. Distance of zero is actually the perfect similarity. Like, like user with similarity zero would be the user that's exactly the same as us. So we sort the users and we see that these first, I don't know, like five or whatever, users with ID 42, 57, seven are actually more similar to us. And basically now, now, now there are tons of ways how you actually inherit the ratings, but I'll just use the, the most simple one. What I will do, don't get in, intimidated by this code. So what this, what this code does, it takes first, first 10 users, which are most similar to us, and they just, it takes the movies that these users rated, and we didn't, and it just counts how many times was each movie rated by a guy or a, a gal or girl that's, that's not us, right? And basically, eventually, it, it gets to a matrix where you have movies which we haven't rated, but other users have rated, and the more similar people have liked the movies we didn't, we say that those movies are actually something that we want to recommend to us. That's actually, like, that, that's, that's pretty much the, the it's, it's pretty simple, but it's, it shows you the basics of what a recommendation system could be. And this is called actually user to user, user based recommendation system because you're finding similar users and based on similar users, you are actually recommending based on what they liked, you recommend what you might like. And why am I saying that there is an item based strategy where you actually take movies or items that you're recommending and based on the similar items you recommend, like if you like this item, well, you might like the items that are similar to this one. And for this user, we could see some of the movies that he might have liked, right? Grumpy Old Man, Four Rooms, Restoration, whatever. And that's, that's a very basic recommendation system out there. And uh, this, this group, of recommendation systems, you might think it's, it's actually like basic and simple, but it's called collaborative filtering and it's actually incredibly useful because there are a lot of advanced ways how you build like advanced collaboration, uh, collaborative filtering systems. Now, this is the basic stuff uh, and let's level up a game a bit now. Now, as I told you, basically the whole difference between Data classification is that you have like data fully specified, like you have all columns specified, but in rating, ratings matrices, you don't really have the data specified. So you can't use, for example, K and N, and because data classification is something that's pretty much explored a lot, whereas ratings, uh, 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 recommendation systems are not really, not really something that has been explored much as, as we will talk further. But turns out that there is one really powerful way of going from unspecified matrix to a fully specified matrix. Basically, if you can go from right-hand side to left-hand side, you could use just any data classification technique, right? And these techniques are actually called dimensionality reductions. You take like a, 
I don't know, matrix with, with like 1,000 columns, and you go from that to a 100 sparse values, and, and you go down to, for example, 10 dimensions which are fully specified. And it actually looks like something like this. You go from M rows, which are M users, and uh, features are actually movies, right? So you have a sparse matrix, you apply a dimensionality reduction, which you can think of as, as a pretty much a black box, which is a, a, a quite an interesting te technique on its own to, to investigate, and you get a fully specified matrix. And you might think, like, like how the heck does this work, right? But it actually works, and it turns out that one variation of this actually won the Netflix prize, which is something that Netflix uses and which we will mention a bit later on. And there are two main ways, and they are actually just beautiful just to explore. Just reading about them is actually absolutely beautiful, honestly. They are called principal component analysis and singular val value decomposition. The second one is, is something, s a hybrid of, of the latter one is something that Netflix uses. But basically, what these two do is they give you, like from the right hand side, they give you a fully specified matrix, and once you have a fully, fully specified matrix, you can actually use any data classification algorithm, right? Now, how hard can it be in Rubik's ML, right? Well, it turns out it's, it's pain in the ass, to be honest, and, and one of the reasons why I said that, that there are some stuff where, where maybe, maybe, just maybe, after this you might consider contributing, but turns out that Rubik's ML has a perfect way of doing uh, dimensionality, uh, dimensionality reduction, and it's, uh, it's, it's called transformers, I think, but the problem is it, it, it's missing some stuff like dropping a column. And when it comes to dimensionality reduction, and I'll go back to this slide, th this could be a bit hard to grasp at first, but it's really easy. Like, once you go, to a fully specified matrix, how do you actually train your model? Like, how do you make the predictions? Like, how do you make actual predictions? Well, it turns out that the way to make actual predictions is to isolate each column, make that column a label, and use the remaining columns as, as a training data. So basically, you would have as many models as you have columns. And again, it, it could be, if, if you never dealt with it, it, it could be something a bit harder to grasp at first, but it's actually really easy. And that's exactly what this code here does. And there is a function that I had to write, which, which pissed me off to, 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 you wouldn't believe how much, but uh, convert column to label, oh, Jesus Christ, I'm not left-handed. Convert column to, into label is pretty much like drop a column and convert it into a label. And basically what I'm doing is dropping a column, training a model, and then basically you save those models and you can use them for, for making uh, any, any further predictions. Again, could be a bit complex, but it's actually extremely easy once you grasp the concept. So again, I would highly suggest you to either ask me about it or just play with it a bit. And finally, we covered collaborative filtering, which is pretty much like find similar users or find similar items. We covered dimensionality reduction, which is basically go from unspecified to specified. And there is a third way, which is called content-based models, which is actually extremely easy to understand, followed by these two, which is basically you just want to recommend stuff based on some of the features it has. And if you're talking about movies, you could say, you could take the tags for a movie and based, based on the tags, you could actually create a matrix and find movies similar to the one that, that you liked and you know, like, uh, recommend staff. Stuff. So for example, Termin Terminator 2 has these tags, and you could actually create a matrix with movies, uh, with movies where the columns are actually tags, and basically, you know, like use one or zero based on whether that movie has that, tape, that tag. One thing to notice is there is no user here. This is completely content-based. It has nothing to do with user, right? It's, it's solely based on like, if you like Terminator, I, I don't care your, your preferences, but if you liked this movie, you might like movies similar to, 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 to this one. And why is this important? Well, it's important because there is this concept called cold start, which is something like, if you have a new user, how do you say, like, how do you recommend anything to a new user? It's, it's you know, it's cold, just like cash. You have to warm it up. And one way to overcome, there, there are many ways, but one way to overcome a cold start is to actually just, like, most like Reddit or Quora ask you, like, tell me about some of your interests, and then based on those interests, they actually recommend, you know, do, do the content-based recommending, and they recommend you, like, like, groups or whatever to follow. 
And finally, one, one quite surprising thing to learn is that recommender systems were pretty much going through dark ages until 2006. And it was actually Netflix. There was a competition called Netflix Prize where Netflix offered $1 million to anybody who could beat their, uh, their original recommendation system. And the competition took three years. It was ended in uh, 2009. And basically, the winning algorithm was actually a combination of SVD, like singular value decomposition, plus some hybrids around it. It beat the, 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 the Netflix algorithm by 10%. It was better by, by, by 10% than their base algorithm. The guys won basically uh, $1 million. And this is actually, funny enough, this is actually what, what literally rocketed the, the further, uh, further development or research or anything in recommender systems, believe it or not. And if you're actually willing to learn more, which I would encourage you, I, I would hope that this kind of encourage you to learn a bit more, you can go to rexis.acn.org, which is pretty much like a conference which is solely dedicated to, to, to further research in recommender systems. You have it like, like for each year there was a conference, and what I, what I found surprising which I only found the other day, is that they have a YouTube channel where, where they literally upload every presentation from any, pre from any work or whatever, like presentation that was held on the conference. And I just think that's amazing because you can learn a ton about recommender systems just, just uh, by, by, you know, like, like opening a YouTube. Now, with that, I wouldn't waste any, any more of your time. This was already enough. I would like to thank you very much for... Uh, for, for, for being present, for watching. Since I'm preparing this for, uh, for next week for an international PHP conference, I would really appreciate a feedback. L like you can scan this QR code, provide me a feedback, be as honest, it's anonymous, be as honest as possible, your, your feedback really matters to me or you can like follow my blog, blog find me on Twitter or LinkedIn and uh, yeah. And uh, so thank you very much uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions if there are. I won't leave without, you know, like I usually don't leave without at least one question. Come on. Oh, Mil. There. It's very much on the subject. Verovi li nekako odeš na Rexis, pošto sam istraživao... Ogroman napor, ja nisam istraživao, ogroman napor i dosta... Dosta istraživanja se ulaže u graf i veze, zato što mislim, sad skoro sve je prešlo u grafovi, interkonekciji i tako dalje. Ja lično nisam istraživao, ali je enorman broj white paper prezentacije i tako dalje fokusiran na na grafove i graf rekomendacijene. Čega? Ne, ne, mislim, imaš... Ne, ne, ima... Šta je... Ne bih znao da ti kažem, ali iz onoga što sam vidio, deluje mi da se izgleda bolje rezultati dobijaju iz graf podataka, zato što je verovatno, pretpostavljam da je lakše naći, što kažu, similarity, zato što ono kao gledaš šta je povezano, ali gledaš šta je povezano sa čim i tako dalje. Tako da mogu da pretpostavim Mogu da pretpostavim da bi graf data bio bolje, ali nisam radio s tim iskreno. Ajmo još jedno. Niko? Dobro, ništa ljudi, hvala vam još jednom. To bi bilo to.